Hello, and welcome to Great Times Behind the Wines, the show that reveals the key players, skills, and community that make a family-run Finger Lakes winery successful. I'm your host, Shannon Hazlitt Hartz. For today's episode, a bonus for our launch, we'll be diving into some tips and tricks for tasting wines with Hazlitt's vinifera winemaker, Michael Reedy. Vinifera, for those newer to the world of wine, is a term that refers to grapes that originate in Europe. I'll also be chiming in with some definitions and additional information. Let's start with a bit of information about Michael. He studied at Cornell University's new Enology and Viticulture program. Enology is a science that involves wine and winemaking. He came to Hazlitt in December 2006. Today, he's in charge of making Hazlitt's award-winning vinifera reds and whites, as well as a very special hybrid ice wine. Michael's main tip for tasting wine like a professional? Follow the five S's, which are see, swirl, smell, sip, and swallow. The first thing you're going to do when you're tasting wine is you're going to see it. So you're going to see, you know, a white wine, is it, does it have a green tint to it, like a green tinge to it? That's going to be a fresh, bright, new wine. Uh, is there more of a golden color to it? I mean, that's probably something that maybe was barrel aged or something older, um, uh, maybe a late harvest wine, reds, you know, how deep is the color? How dark is the color? You know, just what does it look like? So that's, that's a big thing that's going to kind of set you in, your brain into a certain area. You know, a, tasting glasses, if you're in a, in a true environment, are, are, bla are black crystal. So you can't see what's in the wine. So your, your brain is not skewed one way or the other to think it's, it's this or it's that because you're, the first thing you're going to do is see something in your eyes. So in a sensory ex experiment, it's black glass. You want to smell it. You can taste it. I've mistaken a red wine for a white wine and a white wine for a red wine in the past because of when I'm seeing sensory wise. And it's really interesting that way. So that was, it's the biggest thing is probably, you know, just repetitive tasting. Michael then moved on to talking about the second S in the five S's of wine tasting, swirl. So the next part is you pick up the glass and you, uh, you know, you swirl it. And the whole swirl process is what you're doing is you're spreading a very thin layer of, of wine on the glass on the inside. And what that's going to do is going to make the aromatics come out much easier than just that static top of the wine if it's just sitting in a still glass. So now you've just taken that little bit of wine that's sitting there flat in the glass and you've just doubled or tripled the amount of surface area with those chemicals have the ability to come out. And a nice wine glass is going to focus those, those smells and aromas up to your nose. Uh, one thing that people get uh, a lot of big question is legs. What do legs mean? Legs really don't mean anything. The only thing legs mean is there are the more legs, the more stuff other than alcohol is in the wine. So a nice white, dry white wine, when you swirl it, there's not gonna a lot of sugar. There's not a lot of tannin. There's, you know, it's alcohol and water and some acid. You're not going to see a lot of legs, but people a lot of say, all the time say, you know, legs is a demarcation of a quality wine. Not at all. You can have uh, a wine that has a hundred legs and is just not a great quality. So what basically is happening when legs come down is alcohol is evaporating at the top between each leg. So where it evaporates, all those other things, sugar, tannins, whatever other stuff is in there is going to glom together and then run down the side of the glass. So ice wine has a lot of legs because there's all that sugar, all that acid, and all that alcohol in there. Tannins are bitter compounds found in grape skins, stems, and seeds that can leave the mouth feeling dry. So what you want to do is, you know, first is see, then you swirl, then you smell. So obviously you're spreading that, and then you sip. So those, those four or five senses that you get are, are basically going to play in with the aromatics. So when somebody says they taste cherries, they're, they smell something that reminds them of cherries. Then they get a sweet element to it. And then they get a little tang. So their brain automatically puts these things together because that's how our brains work. And it goes cherry. And the way I like to liken all this is think of a light bright. So light bright, it's got that thing that we all had as kids. And it's got the little thing and you put the, put the little pegs in there and there's the light from the backside and it's got, you know, red color, green color. And then if you put things in the shape of a cherry, well, your brain has got all these responders, uh, chemistry responders and aromatic responders. So you smell stuff and you taste stuff and it hits the neurons and it goes up into your brain and it forms a picture because that's what your brain has been trained to do all these times. And, you know, it's like, oh, I, it's cherry to me. Well, the funny thing is, is I might say it tastes like cherry and you might say it tastes like 
strawberry, but neither of us is wrong because that is your own personal construct of what you're getting. So we have the same basic hardware, but it's wired a little differently. So that's a big thing when people say, you know, I taste cherry for, you know, if somebody's a, like me as, as a winemaker says, I taste cherry, but then somebody who's just a, you know, a normal wine drinker says, well, I really get strawberry. Nobody's wrong. If you get strawberry, you get strawberry. And so that's the whole thing. The final S in the tasting experience is swallow, which is also known as savor. Michael explained that in more scientific and professional tasting settings, often wine is spit out because, of course, after drinking enough alcohol, it's hard to appreciate all the elements in a glass of wine. And the, the last aspect of that is, you know, people say, you know, that you're supposed to spit if you're tasting wine. That's definitely the truth. When you're tasting wine in a technical or a sensory or clinical aspect, or if you're at a you're a wine judge at a competition, because the more alcohol you drink, the more your senses are dulled, the less you can actually judge on what's going on. But the real thing wine is meant to do is is to be drank. So the last one should be swallow. So what you do is you swallow that wine, and the very last thing that you're going to get is after you've swallowed, you're going to breathe out, and there's this sensation called retronasal. So What's going on is you're breathing and it goes back, all those aromas go back out your nose. So that cherry might then become strawberry or the strawberry might become cherry. So that's when there's tasting notes of it smells like this, it tastes like this with a note at the end. So those are all things that are coming from the exact same glass of wine, but it's how your body is receiving and responding to them at any given time. Does retronasal make anyone else think of a nose wearing disco pants? Just thought I'd throw in that funny mental image I had as I was putting this episode together. In all seriousness, what I love about what Michael is saying is that there are no perfect answers when it comes to tasting wine, and everyone's experience can be unique. It can be fun to see all the different flavors and smells a group can get from the same glass of wine. However, of course as a winemaker, Michael must know certain qualities that are usually associated with specific wines, which he'll now describe. You know, a Riesling versus, um, say, a Savion Blanc or even a Cab Franc. They have things that are just basically associated with them in terms of aromas. For Cab Franc, I get, a, I get cranberry, I smell violet, and I get, um, you know, something like raspberry as well. Those are three big things. For Riesling, I get, I get honeysuckle a lot, uh, apple, peach or pear, or something like that. Those are chemicals that are in the, or in the grapes themselves that that come out so it just they're 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 you know the same species but they're, they just taste a little bit different there's a little things going on so there's that aspect of it is what does the grape have to offer a perfect example is actually gewürztraminer it uh it it can it has a chemical called cisrosoxin which is found in gewürztraminer and only fruits like lychee there's that smell and aroma that is only there so that's what makes gewürztraminer so interesting is it has this aroma that it's only found in a couple of fruits around the world, so it's very distinctive. So that's there. There's nothing you can do about that. Wow, that's awesome. And it must be tough with, you know, as you mentioned, everyone's different interpretations of different wines. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, um, is there ever a time that someone's gotten, like, a surprising note or characteristic out of a wine? Well, I wouldn't say it's, like, interesting. Like, one of the things I've gotten, especially for, um, uh, I wouldn't say surprising but i always kind of find things funny i will i will say this actually i am actually a huge advocate of no tasting notes i hate tasting notes i think they're horrible really because i don't know what you taste and smell yeah. and you're not wrong by saying what you taste and smell and i think it almost hinders a, a winemaker especially a neophyte somebody who's just trying to figure their way out in the wine world and and wants the best experience to try to tell them what they're supposed to get i think is you know horrible now i mean it's just like you know it's like when you're in english class and you read that book it's like you know what's the theme of this book and it's like oh, i got this and it made meaning to you and they're like no that's wrong it's like no it's not wrong this would have meaning to me yeah. just because you know somebody wrote that or this is what the, the book is telling you to teach me doesn't mean anything so in that aspect i think there there's that but i've definitely gotten one of my favorite one of my favorite um tasting notes especially for red wines that have a certain characteristic that i really can't put my finger on 
is pencil shavings. There's this oh. kind of graphite-y, it, not in like earthy in a bad way. There's a little bit of, maybe it's just an element of, and that's another thing. And there's like, maybe I'm getting a little bit of the oak characteristic and maybe I'm getting a little bit of this and that. And all of a sudden it comes together and my brain goes to pencil shavings, but it's not pencil shavings, but it kind of reminds me of that. There's, you know, there's, there was a wine that when I worked back at Lucas years and years ago it was called, God, what was it called? Mistletoe Magic. And it was meant to be a holiday wine. Oh. And it kind of, it was it was a Gewurztraminer base, so it had that. But then there was some other elements to it, and it was just like it smells like my grandmother's kitchen <laughs> at Thanksgiving, and more like when she's making the pie, not when she's making the the, the turkey. So, but that went to my brain. And another one is um, which I found really interesting. Uh, so ice wine, ice wine. Typically, you're going to get some Botrytis out there. Botrytis is a is a it's a you know a, a mold. But it's uh, it's a good mold in a certain way. Like you can get bad botrytis, but when it dries out and matures properly, it gives you these beautiful notes of marmalade, and it completely changes the way the the wine smells. And we had tasting notes because you know I'm asked to do the tasting notes. So I was like, you know, marmalade and this and that. And the end note I said was truffles, and I actually meant like the mushroom, the truffle fungus that, you know, if, if, if it goes into, you know, it's sliced on a salad or sliced on something, it's got just that earthiness, but it's alluring and wonderful and it's not overpowering, but there's an element in there that's definitely in the back end because those grapes were affected by uh, the botrytis. So it's on there and I'm sitting there talking to somebody and they're like, I really get the truffles. I'm like, yeah. And I was you know, like, cool. And they're like, yeah. And they started talking about truffles like, the chocolate candies you buy your mom for Mother's Day. And I was, and I was like, but I couldn't say no. Oh, yeah. If they got that and they smelled that, yeah, it's like, but it's like this one, more like a like a truffle, but it's got like maybe, you know, like a fruit filling like this. I'm like, cool. If that's what, you're, if that's what your brain puts together, because that's a lot of these things is your brain just puts stuff together and you get pencil shavings or grandma's kitchen or some sort of truffle that I didn't mean when I put the tasting notes down, but yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, you get a lot of weird things. And I think it's mostly, I mean, sense of smell is the one that's most associated with memory. Mm. So that is why people can just, you know, it, a smell of something just takes you to a place. So, you know, pencil shavings probably reminded me of sharpening a pencil when I was a kid or something. Or or b maybe even blowing off the freshly, you know, freshly sharpened pencil and that little bit of graphite dust is right there in your face. Or, you know, grandma's kitchen or Maybe this person really likes Russell Stover's truffles. I don't know. So you, you've got that element of things. But I think that's the biggest thing is I've, I've heard some interesting stuff. Mint was one from a Riesling from, from uh, Australia. Mint and, yeah, I was like, mint and dill. That was the other one. Dill, like like pickle? We're like, well, no, like fresh dill. I'm like, I get it. Okay, well, power of suggestion. So that can be an amazing thing where power of suggestion actually gets your brain to see it. Or it can be something where it, if you can actually, if you, you can smell if somebody says something and all of a sudden it's there, you're like, oh, I get that element of it. It's great. But if you say something to somebody and they can't get it and they're just like, well, why can't I get that? And that can be very frustrating. So there's, there's that going back to the tasting notes. Like it's fun to discuss, but, you know, just pick up something and read it. You're like, oh, I, I should taste strawberries or I should taste this kind of be can be misleading. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's a level of like psychology knowledge that you probably feel you have that's a little helpful, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yes, if you want somebody to smell. Well, another one is, uh, I mean, it's, it's a horrible aspect of is, you know, a lot of the reds. One of the reasons I've, I've stayed away from certain uh, tasting notes is I used to use Cigar Box a lot. Mm -hmm. Cigar Box was, to me, that's got, a, it's cedar, and there's, and red wine can definitely have this kind of a tobacco, like toasted tobacco note to it, and these other elements. So to me, it's like you just flipped open somebody's humidor. So you've got the cedar in there that's supposed to be doing something, and you've got, the, you know, the tobacco coming into play, so there's this element to it. So I've, you know, said Cigar Box before, and I remember somebody was like, I don't like cigars. I'm like, oh, why not? It's like, my grandfather smoked them and got sick and passed away because of the cigars he smoked. I'm like, okay, I think I will never use that terminology again. So if I was to say that, what I will now say is, you know, cedar and I might throw tobacco in there, but usually like cedars are just a good, instead of cigar box, I'll throw some other things in there, but now it's cedar as opposed to cigar box, but you can see that on, 
you know, things. And then, you know, a big part of it is, uh, you know, saying strawberries. I always go back, I would go like strawberries again, but it's like, oh, I'm allergic to it. But there's no strawberries in that. But their brain is like, well, I can't, I don't want to have that because it's a strawberries. Well, I'm allergic to strawberries. Or I don't like vanilla. Well, I say vanilla because I get vanilla, but you might not get vanilla, but I don't want you to not try this wine because you don't like vanilla. So I've just, you know, taken an opportunity away from you and potentially, you know, a wine sale or a, a new fan away from the winery. So it's like, so there's, there's that aspect, but I understand that people really like the idea of being able to, I mean, Americans and people, we just want to be able to compartmentalize and put, you know, put labels on things and put, uh, you know, put it in a nice little pretty box so we can understand what it is. And it's a very easy way for us to control things. And like, you know, like any sort of science or aspect of nature, it's just like, oh, this is what's going on. And this is why we're doing this. So it's, you know, it's, we don't need that. It's, it's, you know, it's your experience. I mean, in the end, winemaking is completely hedonic. We're doing this because we like to drink and we like how it tastes and we like how it smells and we like the way it makes us feel and the way it goes with a steak or whatever. So, you know, in the end, it's, you know, anything that I think you can do to hinder or limit somebody in that aspect is kind of a, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's deserve, it's deserving to them and it's deserving to, you know, the, the thing as a whole. I do remember a story of a, a little old lady in Watkins Glen. This was years and years ago. And, um, I, I don't know if she's still around or still doing this, but her, one of her favorite things was she would take red cat and would put it in a glass with a little bit of ice and a splash of Coke. But not Pepsi, because Pepsi was too sweet. It had to be Coke. So that's what she did. And I actually never found this out. That is actually something they do in, I want to say, Russia. And then moving east from there, they'll take red wine, even like dry red wines, and throw a splash of Coke in there because that's what, that's what they do and that's what they like. So for me, I've never had it. I don't know if I would like it. But the worst thing you can do is poo-poo on somebody's experience because, you know, that made that little old lady happier than anything. And she loved that. So it's like, who am I to say, oh, that's horrible. You're just ruining it. Michael and I then switched to talking a bit about what happens out in the vineyards to give wines certain characteristics. Michael, do flavor profiles and aromas of wine change based on when the grapes are harvested? Yeah, um, well, so one of, the big things, one of the big things is acidity. Uh, for a great example is is Riesling. We have, uh, God, I can't even tell you how many acres of Riesling we have, but on the typical year, I will have probably seven or eight different tanks of Riesling fermenting. So to give you an idea, we have one tank of Pinot Gris or maybe two, or one tank of Sauvignon Blanc or maybe two. Um, Gewürztraminer will have one tank. So we have eight different tanks, and we pick things, because we make three different styles, I want things picked at different times. So I want a particular block that will be in semi-dry, picked at an earlier time because what's going to do is going to have higher acidity as grapes ripen, the acidity level drops, the sugar level rises, and flavors will, will change. They'll mature, if you will. So I want some nice acidity, and I want some lower sugar because I want a semi-dry that's going to be bright, um, lower alcohol than the reserve would be, uh, with, but with some residual sugar and some nice, some nice flavors like you know peachiness. Riesling later on is going to start to get uh, higher sugars, so which would then result in a higher alcohol. So I want my semi-dry Riesling to be around 10.5%, where I'd like to see my reserve Riesling like 12.5, maybe even 13. But the big thing that you deal with in the vineyards is it's not the linear. We, uh, we will sample grapes on a weekly basis or every four or five days as we know they're getting close to getting ripe and we're just kind of tracking things but the big thing is flavor so flavor the 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 physical maturity of the grape and the flavor profile of the maturity of the grape are not you know they're they're not linear so certain years like a hot dry year you might have your acids and your sugars climbing high while your flavors are kind of lagging behind so that's another big decision we we're we would have to make is you know, that, that Riesling block is, it's at 22 bricks, which is going to make a 13% alcohol wine. The flavors aren't quite right there. What do we want to do? All right, well, do we let the flavors mature and then possibly back blend in some Riesling from earlier in the season to kind of lessen the alcohol? Or are we just going to let it roll and see what happens and see maybe we can get to a point where it gets cooler and the flavors will start maturing, but our sugars and our acids will kind of maintain themselves. So that's a, you know, that's a, again, trying to find that optimal time for what you're trying to do. Michael, are there things that a winemaker can do in the cellar or lab to influence the flavors and aromas of a wine that you are making? There are treatments prior to fermentation, things like skin contact to draw some 
precursors and flavor aroma and flavor and aroma chemicals out of the skins. There's yeast selection, so that's a big thing. Yeasts are all, you know, it's all the same species, but there are so many. If you get a, a catalog for winemakers, I get five or six catalogs a year, and each catalog has 30 different yeasts in there. And this yeast was identified in, uh, you know, the, the, the Rhine region of Germany. This one was identified in Bordeaux. So they have different characteristics, and they'll even tell you, you know, this one is going to amplify these kind of flavors or aromas. So that's a big aspect of it as well. And then beyond that, the aging process. So a big thing is for, you know, for especially for red wines or stuff like barrel fermented Chardonnay, you know, what's your barrel selection? You know, how old is the barrel? Uh, what oak did you use in the barrel? So newer barrels are obviously going to have much bigger oak flavor and toast aromas imparted to the wine. Uh, different species of oak, say French oak, has got more of a baking spice characteristic, so I get a lot of nutmeg and cinnamon. American oak has got a uh, very vanilla kind of coconut tone to it. Hungarian is kind of in the middle, not so much coconut, but a little more vanilla with some of that baking spice. And, and then, um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's so many different elements to what you can do to kind of bring out flavors and aromas during the whole process. But really, you're just trying to, you know, the biggest thing for me is you're trying to make the wine representative of the grape it, the grape it is. I want, I want the wine to, like, yeah, that's a Cab Franc. I don't want to have a wine that you're just tasting. It's like, wow, that's just, it's oaky and it's a red, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I want you to taste the difference between the wines. Same with the Rieslings and all the other ones. You're just trying to bring out what the raw material is. As you can tell, Michael is very passionate about his craft. He wants to make sure the integrity of the grape comes through in every wine that he makes so you can appreciate the final product in your glass. Michael is able to achieve this by working closely with Hazlitt's vineyard manager, John Santos. You can learn more about how they work together and value each other's important roles at Hazlitt by checking out the first episode of Great Times Behind the Wines, From the Grape to Your Glass. We'll also have future episodes that allow you to learn more about Harvest in the Finger Lakes and Hazlitt's four remarkable Rieslings in three different styles. For today, that's our show. A huge thank you to Michael for sharing all of his winemaking expertise, to talented musician Derek Strybig for the wonderful custom music, and to the incredible Stephanie Jarvis for her editing help. The website Zapsplat also provided the fun disco music earlier in the show. And of course, we saved the biggest thank you for last. We truly appreciate you, dear listener, for spending your time with us to learn more about the behind the scenes, processes, and people of a family-owned winery. We hope you can use the knowledge you gained from this episode to enhance all of your future wine tastings, whether they are in the comfort of your own home or while enjoying a laid back and relaxing visit to one of our two tasting room locations, either on the southeastern shore of Seneca Lake or in Naples, New York, near Canandaigua Lake. And of course, you can always tune into this podcast wherever you have internet which, if you're a millennial like me, you make sure is just about everywhere. But that's why I'll always appreciate a break from screen time and a glass of wine with my family and friends, which I'd say now includes you, since you took the time to listen to this show. Thank you again, and we hope you return soon for more secrets and stories about the wondrous world of wine. Cheers! Cheers!